So I really appreciate the opportunity for y'all letting me talk to you today about why my research matters. And um, since I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to hop right into it. Today I want to explain to you why my mother calls me a fish dentist. And I think the best way to explain what it is that I do is by posing a question. And the question is, what similarities can we draw between a frog and an archer? If you don't know the answer, just give a second to think about it. I'm talking to my lab group specifically because they've all heard this like a billion times. But just really sit on it, think about it. All right, time's up. So the short answer is by slowly loading its leg muscles and then quickly releasing the tension stored in those tendons, frogs far amplify the resultant force output that comes from those muscles than would be possible through direct muscle action alone. In the same way that that slow kind of draw of your bow followed by the quick release of the string is going to shoot that arrow way past what would be humanly possible. A lot of my fellow participants today are going to be talking about things that have these kind of direct human applications, but myself and my lab, now nah, we're more interested in really trying to understand questions that don't really concern you boring old mammals. Nah, so what my lab and I focus on is trying to understand how fish eat. More specifically, how they do things like this. So fish represent over 32,000, yeah, it's cool, right? Fish <laughs> represent over <laughs> 32,000 species of vertebrates or things with the backbone, and they often elicit these morphological extremes to overcome this task of effective nutrient uptake or feeding. You see, feeding can be broken down into three distinct parts between ingestion, reduction, and then finally transport. And what I focus on is the process of reduction, where we break down our foods prior to the process of transport or swallowing. And so my day is typically spent studying, observing, and thinking about these weird bony outgrowths in our mouths because teeth can tell us so much more about an organism than what you might expect. So if teeth tell us a lot about an organism, just what do teeth like these tell us? So I actually took this picture myself at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology when I was looking for inspiration for like my dissertation. And I found these in the fish section. I was like, man, these things definitely got to be mislabeled. Like, There's no fish with these weird teeth in their mouths. But when I did a little digging, I found that stories like this are kind of rampant. Oklahoma girl catches fish with human-like teeth. <laughs> so I literally just typed in fish with human teeth into the, into the search bar. <laughs> come on, I got to go. <laughs> I typed this into the search bar because, as we know, all good research questions come from these strange Google searches. This particular fish is a species of serous salmon known as the paku. And my entire dissertation kind of came from this idea if teeth tell us a lot about an organism, just what the heck do these teeth say about this fish? The owner of that particular set that I found is known as Colossuma macropomum, or the giant paku. And these fish are native to the Amazon River Basin, and they consume an herbivorous diet, and they chew it with their incisors like teeth, and it cons consists of like nuts, vegetables, and fruits. Interestingly, these fish are going to be in the same family as your highly carnivorous, kind of notorious at this point, piranhas, and so the question then changed to, given the differing diets between these two fish, what structures or mechanisms facilitate two vastly different diets from two closely related species? The first giveaway, of course, would have been the teeth, because we all know this intuitively. If you think about your common like house cat or dog, it's going to be a carnivore versus like a hamster or a gerbil. But I knew that to really answer this question, I had to get a little bit uh, more in depth within this subject. And so from reading the literature and doing some anatomical studies myself, I found structures like these that had the potential to really facilitate one diet over the other. But to definitively um, test these preliminary results, I uh, decided to enlist a technique that was developed right here at Brown. And so what my lab uses is something called X-ray reconstruction and moving morphology, or XROM. And what that is is that we combine high-speed X-ray videos that, framed at, uh, that are filmed at about hundreds to sometimes thousands of frames per second with CT scan data so we can see what's happening inside of an animal. And from these data, we can really slow things down to see what tiny movements are associated with the actions that we're interested in. And it gives us this huge wealth of data. But this whole entire conference is basically based off like what really matters or why our research matters. So why does any of this matter? Well, as imperfect animals, we as humans are constantly looking for ways to improve ourselves beyond what we have just supplied through evolution. And so I think that the best place to look for these has got to be nature, because nature's been innovating forever. Remember the frog example that I gave you all in the beginning? Well, that idea of spring loading was used to better improve prosthetics for partial amputees. And I'm telling you all, like, the results or the, I guess, ideas that we steal from nature don't end there. 
So from shark skin that was used for swimwear that was eventually outlawed by the Olympics to urchin teeth being used as inspiration for digging robots for the Mars rover, nature is constantly helping us go past what we're stuck with evolutionarily so we can continue to change and evolve and get better at whatever we're trying to do. What I do is basic research. And the merits of basic research are often brought into question because it's hard to see how we get from that huge wealth of data I was talking about to these more practical innovations. But if we look at what's only directly visible, what we know, what we see kind of in front of our faces, we're working with this incomplete picture. And by studying something as seemingly insignificant as, say, a frog or a fish, I really believe that we have the potential to see the complete picture. Thank you.